You're watching the home of The Real Story and this is In The Market. Now, Kenya's economic performance remains solid with a growth rate expected to improve from 5.6% in 2015 to 5.9% in 2016, according to World Bank Group Economic Report. It is projected to rise further to 6% in 2017, the report says. The most recent economic update, Kazi Nikazi Informal, should not be normal attributes this positive outlook to low prices or low oil prices, good agriculture performance, supportive monetary policy, and ongoing infrastructure investments. Kenya experienced strong economic performance in 2015 and has exceeded the average growth for sub-Saharan Africa countries consistently since 2009. The report also notes that Kenya's economy or economy remains vulnerable to domestic risks that could moderate the growth prospects. This includes the possibility that the investors could defy investments decisions until after the elections, that election-related expenditure could result to a cutback in infrastructure spending, and that security remains a threat, not just in Kenya, but globally. Plus, commercial banks have moved to enforce the narrowest meaning of deposit accounts that qualify to earn the 7% or 70% of central bank rate set in the recently enacted banking law. The lenders have in recent days rushed to reclassify deposit accounts to avoid paying the huge interest on clients' funds even as they moved to comply with the capping on the cost of loans. Some banks sent notice to clients informing them that only fixed accounts are qualified to benefit from the deposit rate. This is a marked departure from the recent industry practice that paid savings accounts an average deposit rate of 1.4% according to central bank rates published in April this year. So this is a raft of issues that also we're discussing and of course looking also at Kenya's debt level as well. And we're asking you this morning this question, do you think Kenya's debt level is sustainable? Do you think Kenya's debt level also is sustainable? That also will be one of our key topics this morning. Make sure you hit us on Twitter, TV is a Twitter handle, TV is a profile name on Facebook. And we're holding court this morning with Dr. Colin Sodote, who is a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. Also, we have with us uh, Gabriel Negatu, who is the regional director of African Development Bank. Also, we have with us Phyllis Wakiaga. She's the CEO of Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Also, we have with us James Mureo, who is from the Kenya National Chambers of Commerce and Industry. He's the chairman, the national chairman of the National Economic Diplomacy, Diplomacy Committee, and he will tell us more about also what you think about this new development. And of course, this is also on the front cover of the Daily Nation. We can see a side by story there on the front cover of the Daily Nation. Let me just try and uh, uh, zoom it in for you, but my director may just pick it up so that you can see that side by story there. I uh, will show you, it's, it says, show us the money borrowers Tell banks, two major leading banks have reported a surge in loan disbursement after capping of interest rates. Kenya Commercial Bank says it has less, it has lent, I should say, out 6.3 billion shillings since the law came into effect on September the 14th. Gentlemen, in light of what also I just read there from my introduction, we can see there is a reclassifying of products as well. But of course, there's a surge as well for people going for the loans. So this is a beauty of a new. A banking amendment law. Let's begin with you, Collins. Why are the banks reclassifying their, their products? Is there a loophole in the law that now they're maximizing on? I think you need to look at what banks are doing against uh, their response to the law. Yes. You know, they are reluctant compliance mm -hmm. to this law. Because this is not the first time that the, the law has been discussed. It's like the third or fourth time. And all the times they have complained, they have said this will affect their business. So I think they have while they're complying, there's an initial effort to try and find out how to circumvent the law, how to reduce this impact. Yes. But for me, I think we need to focus on the good news. And the good news is what you've just read on the first page. That mm -hmm. contrary to the skeptics who say that this will lead to stagnation in the economy, this will negatively affect the banks, I think the statement from the banks is showing the contrary, which is a good thing for the country and a good thing for the law. And I think that's what the focus should be on. Mm -hmm. All right, so you know, some lenders also, they're indicating that they will cut down on fixed deposit accounts and they have advised their clients that fixed accounts with more than two withdrawals will be treated as transactional current accounts that do not qualify to earn any interest rates. So are we playing around with this particular law? Uh, if we may come to you also, uh, James Murillo. 
Mm. First of all, let me say I've been vindicated. You remember when we talked about this, uh, Ali Khan was very skeptical. I wish he was here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> He's out of the country. <laughs> yeah, truly speaking, I, I, I predicted what is happening today. Yes. And I said um, there will be a little bit of a ripple, but once the dust, dust settles, I'm, I'm sure it will be business as usual. Mm -hmm. And I suggested that the banks needed to broaden the base rather than deepening, as was the case before. Yes. And they're going to reap the same 100 million shillings from, from 10,000 people rather than 100 million sh shillings from 100 people. Mm -hmm. So for me, this is a good thing. Um, uh, the reclassification of, of loans is something that is an internal uh, adjustment. What is exciting is that central bank is keeping a tab on this. Mm -hmm. And I remember again saying that. If the supervision of this transition period is not up to speed, then there'll be tr problems. But as far as I can see now, banks are complying, in fact, I did also predict that some of the banks will actually charge below 14.5%. That is the case with some of the banks now. So mm -hmm. as central bank, and that's the, really the, the, the control now uh, of these of this, uh, interest rates, mm -hmm. as long as central bank now keeps their appetite managed and manages by, by, by extension the appetite of, of government uh, uh, treasury bills, we are bound to see a lot of good things happening in the economy. Mm -hmm. All right, let's hear from uh, Phyllis. Um, I want to agree with uh, Collins and James that it's a positive indication what is coming out, that more people are borrowing. <coughs> but the other positive thing that we are seeing is that the Nairobi Stock Exchange said that in terms of interest saving, there's about 800 million yes. being saved, which is something that is very, uh, very positive. The thing I'm curious about, though, is out of this money that is being lent, yes. how much of it is going to agriculture or manufacturing? Because those are the sectors that will lead to a lot of uh, positive the development, the drivers of the economy. Yes. So we are seeing a lot of uh, statistics on uh, personal loans. Mm -hmm. But it would be interesting to see, because last year manufacturing, for example, borrowed about 2.8 billion, I mean 285 billion. It was the fourth uh, largest borrower in the country. So if we could have those statistics, how much is going to manufacturing, agriculture, that would be important, so that we're not only looking at personal loans and borrowing in that aspect, mm -hmm. but what is actually going to drive economic growth. All right. Okay, uh, of interest also is uh, the fact that uh, we have the Middle East uh, Bank CEO, the Ren Rana, say, Rana actually, who say that the, the lender has sought clarification from the regulator on how to apply the deposits rate stipulated by the law before it could effect a change. And they're saying there is so little clarity because it is a law without definition. So they are seeking clarification. So is this law uh, without clarification? That's why also uh, every bank will want to, you know, as you say, this is an internal uh, affair, how you want to reclassify your products as well. But w what is a game changer? Are we not reading say, any footprints in some of this rec rec reclassification or not maybe the contractual agreement that we had before? Let's, let's hear from uh, Mr. Negato. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, this is part of the settling down. Uh, the government has introduced something new. Uh, the banks reacted to it, uh, resisted it, but now they have to comply. Yes. Now, as part of this process, uh, you're trying to find your, uh, <coughs> your uh, operating environment. So <coughs> you tweak a little bit with the existing deposit. You tweak a little bit with the legal reading, where are the loopholes in this regulation? Uh, <coughs> the president approved the, uh, signed it into law, mm -hmm. but then there are a lot of details and that are open to interpretation. And I think the attorney general will now, uh, uh, working with the central bank issue, cl clarifications and so on. But it is the job of the banks mm -hmm. to also see where the loopholes are and where they can be a bit more creative. At the end of the day, this reclassification of existing loans uh, uh, <coughs> and saying that anything with more than two transactions becomes a current account yes. uh, thing. Do you think that's fair? It's really a way to measure uh, productivity. You see, when, when you have an account and you have more than two transactions, yes. uh, a, bank, a bank would measure the productivity of its workers by how many transactions they 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 transact, you know, whether it's online, whether it's in person and so on, it makes a difference. So as they look to see where they can squeeze productivity 
in, in their, in their uh, operations, they say, okay, if you have more than two transactions, then it, it, instead of being a saving, it becomes a current account. Now, there is no law that says how many transactions it takes before it becomes a thing, but mm -hmm. they are being creative. And part of this being creative uh, and innovative is to see how they can compensate for lost interest. But what is surprising is that, uh, I think it has also surprised the bank that in, in, instead of a loss, they're seeing uh, a surge in, 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 in borrowing and so on. So I think once they, they, they realize that the sky has not fallen, there will be some adjustment and this is the transition period. So this is to be expected and I, and I wouldn't worry too much about it. It, it. it will sort itself out. Right. All right. Uh, yeah, we'll come to you, Honorable Director Meridian. Of course, we're looking at this particular interest uh, rate blowbacks and we can see we are talking about reclassification of, of products from the banking industry as well. Are they trying to, to you know, jink and duck right now as I had asked because there's no clarity on the law. First of all, do you agree with me that there's no clarity? Are we in agreement? There's no clarity on the law. It seems Mr. Murray mm. is starting to deny there's no clarity <laughs> on the law. The, the, look, even historically, uh, banks um, um, were reticent to pay uh, interest rates on current accounts. Yes. I mean, uh, and, and you saw banks trying to create products um, that are more similar, say, to a savings account. So the, the idea of banks uh, not paying interest on current accounts is not really new. And obviously, if you're in the bank, if you're a bank, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to make money. And so you, you, if the law allows you not to pay interest rates on monies that come to you in current account, then that's what you'll try to do because um, um, you're trying to manage your cost. Um, and then I think we, we shouldn't begrudge the banks because, I mean, they are, they are private entities. They're supposed to be trying to make a profit. On the other hand, the, the banks, particularly the large banks, have a lot of liquidity. And that's why you're seeing, and, and so they are able to, and I can tell you, many of the large banks you will find have anywhere from 50 to 100 billion each in, I would say, excess liquidity. And so they, are, they, will, they, will, they will be forced to really go out and lend this money because of uh, the structure now of the capped uh, rates. So I think overall, uh, this policy uh, has nudged uh, the whole system in the right direction. Uh, as I think as most economists would agree, if it were a perfect market, you would not need to regulate in the manner that we have. But this market is imperfect. It is quite opaque sometimes. And so you're forced to, uh, to, 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 to uh, make law in order to encourage the market to move in the right direction. I agree with Gabriel that, uh, you know, these are early uh, questions of settling down. Uh, and I think that the banks will find uh, there is enough demand for their product uh, when it is priced affordably and, and that uh, their profitability may not really uh, suffer. Right. Uh, Dr. Collins, Dr. Dibal, I think this myth that the law is not clear is just that. Yeah. It's a myth. Yeah. Because... But, but, but this is coming from, listen, from a banking insider who is saying the lenders uh, were taking advantage of ambiguities in law. Because the Central I've Bank of Kenya has refused yeah. to I've offer clarity. The important <laughs> word is taking advantage. I think that's the important thing to keep in mind. Because okay. if you're taking advantage, then there has to be ambiguity for you to take advantage. Uh, so yeah. Can we, can we is, can, yes. even for the constitution, even for laws which are clear, people always try to take advantage. Exactly. Uh, so I think you need to keep that in mind. Because at the end of the day, let's assume that there was even an ambiguity. But what is the intention of the law? <laughs> the spirit of so what is the spirit of the law? The spirit of the law is to ensure that we cap interest rates, number one. But number two, to ensure that the balance between what you charge for money that you give okay. me and what you but give me in money is very clear. But how will it be exceedingly beneficial to Mona Inchi if now the bankers themselves will find ways of jinking and dunking and navigate through the law, the law itself, though you say the spirit and, uh, you know, the... Yeah, the, the yeah, spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you the responsibility all. is on the legislation, uh, is on the legislation side to make sure that the law is, be, is 
is such it's that started, yes. you cannot find a loophole in it. I, I think you, we are putting the owners on the wrong side. The banks are supposed to be making money. And that's what they try. They are private businesses. When we make law, All right. we have to... And now, look, law is a co making law is a continuous mm -hmm. process. Thank you. I, if it turns out that there is a bit of a loophole, then what so, uh, Bunga ought to do is to tighten it. All right, okay. In Can application we? of the law, that's when you realize the loopholes, even for the constitution. Mm -hmm. When we look at it today, we are saying this yeah. needs to be improved, yeah. this mm -hmm. needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. So what we should take is the lessons from this and what mm -hmm. needs to be tightened. Mm -hmm. And central bank exists as a regulator to provide clarity where it's needed. Mm -hmm. But the legislature has the final responsibility of ensuring mm -hmm. laws are clear. All right. Uh, um, Mr. Moreo. Yeah, quite honestly, they, they, the, the banks will always try their luck. Eh? And they will try it any which way. But the truth is, and I said earlier on, this is an internal thing that must be now, that, that's where you're going to see who is, a, who is a, a genuine banker and who is trying to fake their way around. If you look at existing currently now, if you have a fixed deposit, even before the capping of this interest, there were, there were internal mechanisms where I could withdraw my deposit without losing the benefit. There are, there are areas that mm -hmm. the bank can actually adjust. Mm -hmm. It is now this uh, transition period that they are going to try and capitalize on anything that is gray yes. to turn it into profitability <laughs> for the bank. But sooner or later, as long as the, 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 the central bank remains hawk-eyed, they will be caught up because this is what the regulator is supposed to monitor and, 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 and follow through. All right. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. This is not a bad thing. No. You want a <laughs> banking sector that's creative. Yes, you make laws. Laws are never perfect the first time yeah. around. Yeah, never. It's a work in progress. Yeah. But at the same time, the bank now looks to see how it can cut cost. Thank you. And reducing transaction, uh, more than two transactions, is part of the cost cutting measure. And, and that, I think, is not a bad thing. It's okay. a creative thing. All right. Uh, let's one see if one. I'm, 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 I just, I want to say this, eh? and let's watch again this piece. I've become a, a prophet of this, this whole process. <laughs> Maybe you your watch, watch, watch this piece. The default rates now in banks will also drop. Because hitherto, the interest was actually turning good, good uh, uh, borrowers into defaulters because of the high interest rate. Mm -hmm. Now watch, as interest is managed, the, ex the, 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 the increased uh, borrowing will actually be serviced better. Right. That, that I can put on the table. Okay, but also there were bugbears and fears as we're winding up now on the interest rate cuppings and the blowbacks of it. On uh, uh, the microfinance bit from the banking sector as well through mm -hmm. the mobile uh, telephony as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the law does not speak about microfinance institutions at the moment and as we had also the CEO of uh, KCB saying, and he says our mobile lending is currently a micro-business product, right? Mobile lending by banks include, of course, Mshwari. Uh, we have also M, M, M Coop Cash, uh, KCB, M Pesa, and Equital as well, has been dispensing billions of uh, 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 billions at rates of between 5% and 10% mm -hmm. a month, which mm -hmm. when compounded annually, ranges between 60% to over 100%. And there was a threat, as I mentioned. There was bugbears and fears that they are going to pull out uh, these services. But we've seen also KCB are looking at the daily. Is it the business daily today? They've reinstated uh, their lending or the microfinance uh, M-Pesa uh, mobile banking. Can we, can we talk about this as, as a way? This, did the, the law also overlook this particular microfinancing when it comes to interest rates as well of uh, the mobile mobile banking let's begin uh, with you i think the reality is the regulation of mobile banking has been a concern for in this country for yes. several years now yes. because it's uh, a new innovation and as soon as it came you've seen the back and forth in the initial conversations <coughs> as to whether this is a normal form of banking as to whether it should be regulated and how it should be regulated so i think to the extent that the law did not deal with it exhaustively mm -hmm. is something that just adds on to the need for us to have a robust legislation to address mobile banking. Yes. The reality is that mobile banking is here and now and the amount of people it is reaching, if you look at it in terms of intention, the intention of capping interest rates, as James has said, was to widen and not deepen. Mm -hmm. The same thing that mobile banking has been doing. But <coughs> as we go through implementation, we need to look at how we enhance our legislation also in regulating mobile banking. All right. Okay, let's get your headline thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, well, look, um, if, you, if you read the uh, memorandum of objects and reason in the, in the making of this law, yes. because, you know, when you make law, you have to sort of explain why are you making the law. Now, it's quite clear that it is to uh, 
make interest rates um, affordable across the board and to also make uh, savings uh, attractive uh, to the citizen. So uh, mobile, using the mobile to either lend or save, the mobile is a tool. So I think that the, the banks are extending creativity uh, a little bit there. Uh, because lending, uh, whether you do it on mobile or, you know, in the old traditional way of sending money on the matatu or some other thing, lending is lending mm -hmm. and, and saving is saving. Uh, so I don't think the, the, the and I don't think, um, as you will see in the interpretation, uh, that really, uh, and some banks have already acknowledged that uh, lending on mobile um, falls very much within the ambit of this law. All right. Okay, you have yeah. a final question? Yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think if eventually, Deval, uh, what you will see is the settling down and, 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 and you will find the microfinance uh, institutions in this country are the ones who have actually pushed this agenda of, of recapping the interest uh, rates because they themselves started regulating. They were lending at lower rates and much easier terms than the banks. So slowly now, if now they become the, the, the ones who are who are too expensive, the, 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 the Monaichi is spoiled for choice. They can actually go now to the regular banks and, and, and borrow at that control until there, there is a market equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And once that is achieved, then like what Enrito Moredi uh, said, there will be no need for laws. Now it will be a self-balancing uh, situation where if you are too expensive, you are thrown out of the market. If you are lending right, you are you're in business. Right. Um, so we will find a natural uh, progression of things uh, and it will settle down once uh, um, the open market operations are fully um, in gear. The, the, the key difference I think you're going to see here is, uh, as Moredi has said, <coughs> yes, mobile is just a platform. Yeah. But when the law says bank, it means all deposit-taking institutions, mm -hmm. okay, which includes uh, microfinance. The only difference here is microfinance by mandate and by definition have a greater appetite for risk than your normal bank. Mm -hmm. People whose credit worthiness may not make it in, in, in your normal bank may get access to finance in a smaller microfinance, which is uh, smaller amounts of loans, closer to the community, closer supervision and so on. So their, up, their risk appetite and their risk Pricing is different than the regular bank. You may begin. You may see a small difference there, but otherwise, uh, James said that the market will regulate many of these issues. Mm -hmm. And mobile banking, Nepal, is also very attractive to banks. Yes. It's less expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, there is less, less transaction. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they will they will find it the preferred way of, of transacting uh, slowly. Mm -hmm. And for me, the indication from KCB that they are coming back with the, the m -shuari means that they are already finding a way to go around it. Yeah. So that was the initial shock so of so the it law. Was, it was a big, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So but yeah, eventually, everything will level out. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, let's go, okay, drill this conversation uh, uh, deeper right now. And we look at Kenya's debt burden. And I think we've never exhausted on this program the Kenya debt burden. And I, I wish today that we will do that. And of course, our viewers, what we're asking you is, we are asking you, is Kenya's debt level sustainable? Is Kenya's debt level sustainable? Let's hear from you as well. You can call and ask questions or share your contribution as well. Uh, you can hear us on Twitter. AM Live NTV is a Twitter handle. Also, you can give us a thumbs up on Facebook. AM Live NTV is our Facebook profile. On You can give us a thumbs up there. Right. The World Bank has raised the alarm over Kenya's growing appetite for foreign loans, saying it could expose the economy to financial distress and stall development projects. And I just, just want to also run by you uh, some of the findings that we have, especially when it comes to bridging budget deficits in this country. Let's, let's begin with you, Collins. I think first I get very surprised at the World Bank. <laughs> uh, because if you look at the statements they make, they <coughs> blow hot and cold. Yep. Uh, and sometimes I think, in my honest view, they play politics with economics. Uh, in my view, there is nothing wrong with getting money from China. Yes. So when you hear statements saying that you must look beyond China, you hear some sense of rivalry, which I think is not useful for the rest of us. What's more important, though, is to ask ourselves about what are the terms on which we are getting the loans from China. Mm -hmm. and I think that's the point that Jayindi yes. was saying. And that's, the one, yes. that's what should worry us as a country. Yes. What should worry us about whether the loans we are getting are concessional, mm -hmm. only in theory, 
but in practice are commercial. Mm -hmm. So when you see, for example, that you are paying interest rates, you're paying higher interest than the, than the principal payments, repayment, yes, yes. you must ask yourself for how long is the debt reducing? Because that's even the debate around this capping of interest rates. Because yes. the, even at the domestic level, the challenge has been you borrow one million shillings, you pay for the next 20 years, yeah. and nothing has changed. <laughs> so I think we need to take that even to the conversation in terms of external debt. How much are we borrowing and at what rate? And I think that's the bigger concern in terms of the amounts of money we're getting from China. All right. Let's hear from uh, Mureo. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think, again, we have had that conversation before with Nderito, the first time I think we met here. Because World Bank, uh, like Collins has said, seems to play politics in this. Yes, there is need to put some, some controls and measures in terms of managing that debt. But it is clear and it's known that if you compare the, the two loan requirements from World Bank, they give you a list that keeps increasing as you fulfill some of the conditions. Mm -hmm. The list never gets to the bottom. The Chinese will give you five conditions and you meet them and your project is up and running. There is, of course, a, 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 a risk to that in that you might not pay too much detail to, to, to what, what it is that you're getting into with the Chinese. So for a long time, the World Bank has been throwing things at us, but it's about time they also reviewed their conditions of, of lending to us. The reason why we go looking east is because the World Bank has become too bureaucratic. So you find every time you, are, you, you, you fulfill certain conditions, and when you're, when you're in need, uh, Deval, you, you, you don't have much of a choice. Sometimes you even take expensive loans to fulfill a certain need. Yes. If a road, for example, is cut off mm -hmm. and, uh, during the floods and you really must now create that bridge, you may not have time to go and look for the best uh, possible uh, lender. You will actually take the immediate available so that you deal with the problem immediately. Mm -hmm. But for a long time, you find World Bank keeps uh, saying things. There's nothing wrong with borrowing from China. The only thing uh, that the Treasury needs to do is really negotiate the terms properly so that, as Collins again has said, whether it's a, a concession loan, loan or commercial loan, that must be very clear. And, and, and we must have an end to this uh, 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 period of, of, of repayment. Mm -hmm. But there is, there is nothing wrong with the Chinese coming to, to, to our aid if the other loans are too expensive or too difficult to get. All right. Yeah. Uh, there was a very interesting also article, and uh, <coughs> I think we've also read here before in this forum, how Treasury's 700,000 debts every second will haunt the future of generation. 700,000 Kenyan shillings debt every, every mm -hmm. second will haunt the future of, of, of this country. Can, can we hear from uh, for me, uh, Phil, Phil? Thanks, Debal. I'm actually <laughs> looking at uh, some numbers here. Uh -huh. Our revenue growth against the debt growth, I'll say for the last three years. Uh -huh. So in 2014, the revenue growth was 18% against the debt growth of 25%. 2015, 12% against 19%. Last year, revenue growth 13%, debt growth 28%. So for me, that's something we need to keep watching. How yeah. much is our revenue growing yeah. against, our debt? against our debt? And then these debts that we are getting, what are they going into? If it's infrastructural projects, well and good, but are they best priced? Uh -huh. Are we, we ensuring should. that we seal all the loopholes so that the money actually goes where it should go? In, in fact, so we, should, we, we should raise the question because we had yeah. also Mbere South legislator, Mataba Masimi, uh, with the budget committee raising concerns about this particular pu uh, public debt. And he, they were saying they were concerned that Kenya's public investment using borrowed funds has not yielded enough assets to warrant the borrowing. Yeah. Can we weigh on this? This is not coming from actually the investment committee. What, what do we have to show for all this public debt that uh, now we are servicing right now, the loans, and of course we can see also the interest rates, they are skewed. I think the, the, the well, first of all, uh, I wanted to say to my colleagues to, to be slightly nicer to the World Bank because I used to, <laughs> <laughs> I used to work there, there you go. 10 years. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, look, numbers but, also... You know the last time you were here yeah. also, you were... Yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 I do agree. Of, yes. of Honorable I do rating. not agree <laughs> with the, with the, with the, with the bank's the assessment. Yes. I do not agree with the bank's current assessment as to where we are. Having said that, I think I must acknowledge that I worked there for nearly 10 years. <laughs> but I, don't, I, I do not agree with the current assessment. Now, you, you, you numbers uh, have a way of creating a mirage unless you, you analyze them properly. Phyllis is saying about if you track uh, revenue and expenditure, I'm looking also at a graph here from for the last from 2001 to 
to 2015, yes, yes. showing that on the whole, revenue has actually been growing uh, uh, at a slightly, uh, uh, or keeping pace, more than keeping pace with a growth in expenditure. Mm -hmm. So, are we in a big, gigantic problem? I really no, don't think so. No. Does Kenya have plenty of room, in fact, to absorb uh, more debt? The fact is yes, because you have to look at debt, not just in isolation, you have to say, where is your capacity to service that debt? Mm -hmm. Which then leads us to, what are we doing with this money when we borrow yes. it? Yes. And we, I think we all agree, yes. this yes. one agrees, if we are using, like, some money we borrowed from Gabriel here and build a big road here called Thika Road, yes. which is creating Very a lot positive. of economic yes. impact. Yes. Now, if we borrow it and squander it, mm -hmm. you know, that would be a different story. So I think when you look at the Chinese and you say, what is it? What have we 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 are doing standard gauge mm -hmm. with the Chinese. I think that is in the right direction. It's positive. Yes. Yes. Uh, Phyllis yes. and the manufacturers. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I said infrastructural development, uh, exactly. very welcome. So uh. the debt that we are contracting is not uh, for, for consumption, yeah. mm. it is for, for investments. Investment. All right. Now, but, but, but uh, uh, we'll bet to differ on that a bit. Yeah, because yeah. We, we've been borrowing to service <laughs> loans as well, right? We, 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 we had also the, the euro bond. <laughs> And uh, now we also borrow to, you know, to, pay, to repay some loans that we, we owe. It is not fully going to infrastructure and some development as but well. But even Could if it we went to infrastructure, Sorry? I think the devil is in the details. Yes. yes. Because it is, overall, it is okay to borrow for infrastructure. But I think as Philly says, we need to go into the details mm -hmm. in terms of at what rate are we borrowing. Right. And are we using it for the infrastructure effectively? And is the okay. cost of that, of those okay. projects, the can best I, cost? Can I read something from this particular report so that now you can say at what rate? Mm -hmm. Because the, the reports note that over the period of 2013, 2012, 2013, mm -hmm. 2014, and 2015, the allocation towards development grew by 29% mm -hmm. in nominal terms with borrowing forming part of the development financing. However, the rate of completion of projects has been very low. Mm -hmm. The committee notes, as of June last year, there were more than 100 projects which were classified as ongoing. The cost of completing these projects is estimated at three trillion shillings. Mm -hmm. This is a post giver for you. Just think about it as we're taking callers who are hanging on the line as well. Right, we have uh, Gabriel uh, hanging on the line. Godfrey, I should say. Yes, uh, good morning. Morning. Yes, I've been following the, the, the conversation and I think it is very good talking about the loans. Yes, thank yes. you. Yes, one thing which I have to say is that um, uh, loans are good, and we have seen a lot of development which has taken place for the last uh, five to ten years or so, which mm -hmm. has been very, very good. Okay, we have to check the terms, which is very good. This country has the capacity to absorb the loan. That is one thing we have to appreciate. The only problem we have in this country is corruption, which is also eating part of this. If only we could manage corruption, this loan would go a long way to help this country. And even paying that loan will not be a problem, because mm -hmm. I know one thing. The country has the capacity. The economy is growing. The population is growing. We have a very youthful population which need employment, which can also help to generate more, more income. I'm very happy to see that now we are, we are building a dual carry highway from all the way from Mombasa to Nairobi. Another one is starting from Nairobi to Nakuru. This is going to generate a lot of economic activity, and the economy will move fast. So the thing which we should be discussing here, how do we manage these loans, especially the procurement part of it, yes. where... We, we reduce corruption and more go into building the infrastructure. Loan for infrastructure is there. The issue of, of, of borrowing from east and west, I, I agree with one of the, 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 the panelists there. The west have been playing a lot of poker game with us. They come with a list of conditions which sometimes you fulfill this, they come with another one, they come with another one, and, 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 and the Chinese, if the Chinese are coming and telling us, Give us this thing and we will give them a yeah, we go to China. And look at the the thing around now. It, it's good, it's nice driving <laughs> nowadays. It's good. I, I, I am for we take more loans and manage them. Thank you. The country has the capacity. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Onyango. There we have also uh, Michael all the way from Canada. I don't know what if it's in the morning or in the evening in Canada. Forgive me. Uh, Michael, how are you? Hello, Deepa. Hello, Michael from Canada. Hello, Deepa. Morning. Morning, morning, Mike. All right. Is so, it morning in, all, in Canada? I'm not aware. Uh, Canada is 
Me? Okay, fine. Straight to the point. Eh? All right, please. Uh, I just want to contribute to the uh, debate that, is, that you are having in studio. Yes. Um, the, uh, there is uh, uh, this, uh, you have posed a very pertinent question concerning whether Kenya State is sustainable. Yes. I want to say the date is not sustainable so far because um, uh, oh. yeah. Hello, Diba. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Continue because of... How are you? I'm very well. We can hear you. I think maybe there's a delay okay. in between. Okay. So we, you, you're on air. Okay. Just go on. Yes. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Thank you, Diba and the panelists. Uh, straight away, you have put a very important question. Yes. Whether the Kenya state is sustainable. I want to respond to that by saying mm -hmm. Kenya state is not quite sustainable at this point in time. Yes. Allow me to qualify my stand. Briefly, Michael. Let us, let us give an observation to the education sector. Mm -hmm. The education sector is not receiving the required funding. When we look at the GAM, mm -hmm. yes, when we look at the education sector, is not receiving several our children have been learning under three. We had, uh, we had a promise of uh, laptops. Yes. Very few schools, as it were, that have re received this particular uh, promise. Mm -hmm. That is number one. Number two, Look at the unemployment. Now, there is a report that I just, you know, come up uh, by the uh, UN yes. uh, that was uh, done the other day. And uh, it does report that uh, by next year, we are going to have around 17 million young people who are graduate unemployed. Yes. That one signifies something that needs to be addressed. Number three. Yeah, the last one, so right, right, right now, right now, we have several companies that are closed in shop in the Kenya. Yes, that one indicates the economy is not doing well. Yeah. Number four, look at the, uh, the, 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 uh, the agricultural sector, it is actually on debt, on, 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 on debt bed, mm -hmm. it is not really being funded as it were. These are salient concerns that need to be, if it, these are the indicators of a robust economy. Thank you. Now, Thank allow me to congratulate this lady, the old lady, Stalin lady. Uh, actually, you know, the, the gentleman, you know, seated beside her. Mm -hmm. He said that, you know, what has been happening? <laughs> the government has been borrowing money yes. from, especially China, to fix the need at hand. You know, he, he, he in a little state, he tried to imply that you just borrow you know, from whichever means, from whatever means to fix the current situation. All right, thank you. Now, that's Th th thank, thank you, Michael. Uh, we've got the gist of what you're saying, Michael. Uh, we really start for time, but thank you for calling all the way from Canada and also uh, watching the state of the economy here on NTV in the markets. Maybe we can, we can actually weigh in on what he was saying and also looking at uh, various facets of the economy. Yesterday also we did a story here about uh, the University of Nairobi and he's also alluded to that fact that, yes, we are going to have 17 million graduates who are unemployed. I mean, this is a tinderbox waiting to explode, where we have people who uh, have graduated, they have degrees behind their name, but there's no employment at all. Maybe we can respond to that, and uh, we should go, as we are also uh, thinking about our closing remarks, we shall look at how also this debt level has been when also the Jubilee government took. Uh, uh, are we any better since we had the Kenyatta uh, uh, Kibaki regime, I should say, and mm -hmm. now we're having also President Uhuru Kenyatta's regime as well in terms of debt sustenance. The, Where were we? The, I think we are at Gabriel. We are at Gabriel. Let, let's yeah. hear from Gabriel, then we go to Phyllis. Okay. 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 No, thank you. Listen, I, I think this is an old debate, uh, China versus uh, the West. So we don't need to believe no, no, that. Yes, yes. I think we've, we've, we've matured beyond that. Uh -huh. Kenya will get its loans from wherever it finds the best terms wherever it find the best tenure, wherever it find the best price, mm -hmm. east, west, uh, and conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I think we can put that to rest, including, including whether or not the private sector is even best suited. Look at this new project now, Mombasa Nairobi Road. Yes. 
that's going to be a private sector road. It's going to be a toll road, but it's going to be built by the private sector. So Kenya is looking at all options. It's, it's talking about turning some of the existing roads into toll highways, but the Mombasa Nairobi road, mm -hmm. now the tender is, I think, out for the private sector to come build, operate, and transfer BOT. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think we're, uh, <coughs> I think there's no comparison here. But uh, on, on, on the World Bank's advice, let me not uh, comment uh, on, on the sister institutions, but on, on the issue of is the loan yielding return. You know, uh, and Moretti raised the uh, thick highway, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. If you look at the economic return of that road, the, the, the value of property, look at all these malls that have come up, look at all the development that has not, is taking place in that corridor. That's what a road does. That's mm -hmm. what an infrastructure does. If you've got 17 million graduates coming out, you expect to absorb them into industry. Mm -hmm. What does that require? It requires roads, it requires power, it requires all kinds of issues. Next week, I think the president is uh, hosting a summit on youth empowerment. The president is chairing this himself. Mm -hmm. You know, so the government, I think, is taking the right step to address these issues. But uh, the, 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 the Achilles heel in all of this is the absorptive capacity. Absorptive capacity. The absorptive, absorptive capacity remains a challenge. And that's why I think there's now a new delivery unit in the office of the presidency mm -hmm. whose job and only job is to go around and check what is being absorbed, why it's not being absorbed, and fixing the problem. Thank I think you. this is the kind of solution we need. All right. Phyllis, we can come to yes. you to, to comment um, on the, the On the loads, I think we've exhausted the topic. Yeah, can we, can, yes. <laughs> but it's positive if it's going into infrastructure. We've seen SGR, we've seen the roads, the improvements at the port are notable, electricity. So all that is very positive for economic growth. So if we keep it there, and if we watch on what they said about corruption, because that's the elephant in the room, and that's mm. a reality. So that, that's something we need to watch. We, if we borrow to fund corruption, we are definitely not doing the right thing for ourselves and for future generations. Unemployment a big burden for me personally, because as a country, our un unemployment rate is about 17.3%, almost the highest in this region. Countries, other countries are sometimes below 10%. Mm -hmm. When our youth graduate, about 35% of them do not get jobs. So I know the government is really trying to do a lot. And I think the manufacturing sector is one of those sectors where we can really get these jobs. So the agreements we are concluding, EPA was concluded recently. I mean, Kenya signed and ratified and notified last week, meaning we're actually concluding whether it's EPAs, AGOA, and all these agreements, and the manufacturing sector can take advantage of this. However, we need to look at imports. You spoke about the number of Chinese goods being imported into our country. Are these things we can do locally? Because, for example, are we they, are they, they are. Is because it within your we recently sure saw we, yeah, companies push. like Samir um, relocating and about 300 people have lost their jobs in tire manufacturing. Yes. And why? Because the landed cost of a tire in our country is 60% cheaper. So issues of competitiveness are things that we need to address seriously. And what we can produce locally, like we saw in the statistics, cement exports, I mean imports into Kenya, grew tenfold. We know it's about infrastructural projects and all that, but can we find a way to utilize the local capacity that we have to its maximum so that we create jobs locally? Because that's very but critical. Are you doing it efficiently, though? You yeah. see, why is it that uh, Dangote can ship cement from Ethiopia mm -hmm. into Kenya? Cost of and production. You have, okay, then mm. what the does it take to bring down the cost of production? Yeah, that, and that's a conversation. For the consumer, I, look, I go to yes. the market and Definitely. I buy the, 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 the least cost. Yeah. Least cost yeah. Why that's, are that's you not then, why are your members mm -hmm. not being competitive? But because of the cost of production, which is a reality. Yeah. Now, when we were discussing even infrastructure and the cost of putting it, it's, it's, it's not enough to just say mm -hmm. that it is good to build SGR. Mm -hmm. We must ask in terms of at what cost. Because if the cost is too high, while the road looks nice, eventually that cost affects business, it affects mm -hmm. production, and you'll then have a situation where, yes, the, the private sector is producing, but they're producing at a cost which is, makes them uncompetitive. And that's why we need to address well, issues about our cost of uh, goods. Let me, let me just uh, throw in something here. I think sometimes also when we are when we are valuing these infrastructure projects, like uh, Gabriel has said, there are many other there are many other value additions. I mean, value benefits that that accrue from from this infrastructure. And so when we are looking strictly at numbers and saying that revenue has grown 
by 18 percent and uh, and the debt has grown by 25 percent let's not l get lost to the fact that these are long-term projects mm -hmm. uh, these are long-term debts and if you look at the the the, the, the amortized benefit across the the, the, the life of that uh, project i think it's good to to, to appreciate that there is there are the other benefits so if we are too strict, then we might, we might, we might lose uh, the sight of the big picture. Or the, th the thing of it, and let me just weigh in one, one quickly, and it might not uh, please uh, Phyllis. You see, from a policy point of view, you, it's not just manufacturing. It is manufacturing, it is agriculture, it is services. You look at the whole thing and say, yeah. where am I competitive? There can be no doubt, for example, in services, mm -hmm. Kenya is very, very competitive. Yes. And not, and when you look at the conversation now across the continent about diversifying our economies, mm -hmm. it is very much services. We're, we're very so, uh, yes, indeed. Yeah. And if you look at where do I create jobs, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of a sector that has traditionally been ignored, audiovisual and cinema sector, mm -hmm. which is such a gross area and has such serious multiplier mm -hmm. that, you know, it's a bit uh, strange that actually it has not been. Uh, very much in the forefront. Mm -hmm. But you're now seeing African governments, Kenya in particular, paying a lot of attention to what can we do with audiovisual services because it is using technology mm -hmm. and it is using creativity, so it is creating the kinds of jobs that young people yes. are interested yes. in. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, allow me also to come in because also we're really strapped for time a bit yeah. uh, as we're winding up on this. Just to, to also ponder on this, that uh, during Kenyatta's first budget as president, the government had to had a, a total outstanding public debt of 2.4 trillion shillings. In 2014, 2015, the second year, the outstanding debt rose to 200 billion shillings, mm -hmm. uh, to by 200 billion shillings, as you say, to 2.6 trillion shillings. In its third year, the debt grew faster. Mm -hmm. Treasury figures shows that in the current financial year, 2015, 2016, total public debt stands at 3.4 trillion shillings, a staggering 800 billion shillings jump in one year, Ambitious revenue targets tend to fuel more spending requests and can drive up overall deficit. So, in well, light of the figures that I've given you, are we doing any better? Even well, with this what what, what are the equivalent country? figures of GDP? Growth, what what yeah. was GDP? Growth. Uh, uh, even in total quantum, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, three or four years ago. Those figures yeah. are very selective. Yeah? And, and a lot, a lot has happened. We've uh, built infrastructure. We've devolved our government. A lot of things are happening that is leading to more spending. So there's a reality that we'll borrow more, but we need to look at it with other things in mind. Because the economy uh, is right, growing. This, this a, article says, light. I think you should listen to it, it says that the level of debt in Kenya is approaching an unsustainable level and is expected already. Is expected already. The ratio of debt service to revenue has reached its limit of 30% and is expected to bypass its limit in the 2017 by 4.7% points on accounts of debt redemptions and interest rates cost and they are expected to rise substantially in 2017, 2017, I mean 2017, 2018, the report also says this, unpacking the budget estimates 2016, 2017. Are we back to the bank report? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, the government's own view of where, what is the threshold is 40%. Uh, uh, that, that uh, mm. you, you know, uh, debt to GDP. Now, if the bank has set its own threshold of 30%, then mm -hmm. it can come it to its own conclusion. 40% is a realistic, yeah. in fact, some places even 50%. 50 yes. Yes. Yeah, we, we accept, uh, you know, so, uh, Dibao, the debt question really, and it's pushed a lot, I think, out of the West, the, the debt question is about it, the proportion of debt in relation to GDP, not just looking at the debt in isolation. All right. Thank and you. where the economy is, let, we can afford to do thoughts, it. Uh, James, let, let me just say yeah. this. Uh, for me, I, I, I partially uh, want to agree with some of the, the, the red flags that have been thrown. Because our debt is, is growing, if you look at the bloated government that we are running in this country, that is part of the problems that we are having. We really need to manage this devolved system while very uh, very de desirable. Are we managing these debts at county level, at national level? And I think for me, uh, the question here is, do we want to review our constitution insofar as this? Because right at the beginning, when this constitution was passed, 
there was that issue of can we afford this number of uh, people. I mean, if you look at from from the MCAs to the to the governors to the uh, senators, everyone has bodyguards and big cars and everything. And those are some of the things that are increasing these debts. <laughs> truly you. speaking, thank and there is no doubt about it. Yeah. All right, thank you. Can we get headline thoughts uh, from for Negatu coming to also uh, Collins? And uh, Phyllis, yeah, well. let, let briefly, me, briefly, sir. Let me let me give structure to this discussion, and I hope this is probably one of the last things we'll discuss. Kenya, Two, yeah, yeah. Kenya's debt. <laughs> Two, <laughs> Two framework uh, for, briefly, for, sir. for briefly. looking at debt. One is ratio of debt to GDP, and the second is the percentage of export. Now, ratio of uh, GDP to debt, up to fifty percent is still considered sustainable. Is it growing? Yes, it's growing. Is it alarming? Is it uh, something to panic about? No. Mm -hmm. The second is, if your debt is less than 150% of your annual export, yes. it's still at an allowable rate. So, Thank you. Uh, not to get too nervous about this, but two things that we need to do. One is reduce the expenditure side. Mm -hmm. Government mm -hmm. appetite, the yes. counties yeah. and everyone, is growing. reduce that appetite. That, that has to be taken back. And the second is to grow mobilize the domestic saving and uh, uh, yeah, mobilization of resources. KRA need to do a better job. If we do those two, then debt will be okay. Thank you. Collins, your headline thoughts? Uh, two things, but the first one is unlike James, I think we should look at figures. The idea of saying figures don't say enough is sometimes the reason why corruption gets in. Because you say, don't worry about the figures, just look at the overall thing. But the second is as to whether the debt burden is worrying or not. I think constitutionally, the debt burden must concern us. That's even the reason why there was a conversation yesterday between the deputy president and governors. 